Hello, everybody. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Maxon, for having me today. Uh, my name is Michael Rosen, and I have a small company here in Northern California called Samplistic Media, and we do motion design of all types and creative post-production. And today, I'm going to be talking about uh, user interface animation projects, GUI and FUI kind of techniques that we did from these three projects, and these were all in Redshift. But before we get into that, let's take a look at the Samplistic Reel so you can get a better idea of what we do. Okay, so that's the reel, and hopefully you can tell that we do all types of stuff and we really love what we do. So today, I'm going to show you a technique or two from this project that I did for Samsung. And this project that I did for StudySync. And then we're going to dive in fully into this personal project that I did called Aries X. 2044. All right, so let's get started. So for Samsung, we were charged with doing these sort of very abstract social media pieces that would be getting uh, attention on social. And so they're each different, one for AI, one for automotive, one for education, for gaming, and then one for data. And so the one I want to show you about is this one for data where they wanted this sort of like impossible dimensions effect inside an orb floating there and I had to come up with some ways to do that. Okay so real quick what I have set up here is I have a shiny sphere and then I have a plane with this image on it and in redshift we see that that gives us our reflection on the ball. It could be anything but I want to just show you this technique. So you see you've got the image and you've got the reflection. And then I have this piece of glass right here. What's really great in Redshift is that it's biased. So you can control how reflections and light works in non-realistic ways. And if I go to the plane that has the image on it and I add a Redshift tag, and under the Visibility tab, I click Override, I can uncheck primary rays visible, which will mean that the primary rays from this are not seen, but yet the reflections are still seen. And then if I bring this piece of glass over, what you notice is that you do still see it in the refraction, which is actually really useful for some things like making things reveal in magical ways and that sort of thing. But in this case, I don't want to see that either. So I go under the redshift tag again and I uncheck visible and refractions. And now I'm able to see through the glass to the reflections. Okay, so going back to the Samsung effect with this orb, what I have here is a 
the orb tracked in to uh, this shot and there's lots of cool tracking stuff available in Cinema 4D, but I'm not gonna go into that right now. Just really quickly wanna show you how I have this set up. So if I turn off a few things here, you can see that basically what I have is these intersecting shiny cubes and they're moving slightly within each other. Then I have this glass that goes around it. And that already creates some really cool looking refractions and reflections in there, but it's of the environment coming through the glass. So let me turn that glass back off for a second here. And I'll show you that I have this, what I call the reflect orb, which is really a very shiny, reflecty platonic with this image on top. The image is actually an animation put together in After Effects from a lot of stock video of servers. That wraps around our reflective cubes, but we don't want to see it. So we can turn off primary visible, which lets us get the reflections. But then when we bring our glass back over, we're back to seeing that platonic wrapping around, which we don't want to see. So if I uncheck visible and reflections, now we're getting all the reflections in the cubes distorted by the glass as we move around them without seeing the geometry that's causing the reflections. So that's kind of magical. Okay, for this next project, I was tasked with making animations based on these website design files in Photoshop. So I was working in Redshift and there were many files with sometimes dozens and dozens of layers for each. So that was the challenge. The solution for me was all about automation as much as possible in Redshift, in MoGraph, and using a Cineversity plugin called Planesmart that's really cool. So this is all about some tricks that I found. So I had a Photoshop file and I would select that Photoshop file and I would just bring it in via Planesmart here. I'd turn it to flat and um, keep resized planes on and keep the Z offset very small is at one. So when I hit OK, what Planesmart does is it just goes through and it creates a material for every layer in the Photoshop file, but it also, and more importantly in this case, creates a piece of geometry and maps that material on for me. So that's a very nice start, but it's not going to play well in Redshift because those are Cinema 4D materials. So I came, I had to uh, figure out how to do that. There's a couple of gotchas and I just want to take you through a process that um, really worked for me. The sort of trick in this that I found that really made it possible was that there is a feature in Photoshop, let's go over to Photoshop here, where you have your, your Photoshop file, the same exact Photoshop file here open, and I have, you know, the Photoshop file has been simplified down. Each of these layers is just a bitmap with an alpha channel, and you can do that by hitting Command E on every layer. And I've simplified the names down because there are some issues between PC and Mac with respect to file names. Other than that, the trick is to go to export layers to files. And what that does is it allows you to make a folder full of images files that each one correlates to the layers of this Photoshop document. So as long as you have transparency and not trim layers selected, you should be okay. You hit run and it creates a folder. So let's go back into cinema and I'll show you how we bring those into Redshift. Okay, I'm gonna leave these textures alone, but we're going to essentially not use them. I'm gonna go to Redshift and create a new material, and I'm gonna bring in a color splitter. There we go. And I'm going to bring in a multi-shader. Okay, so that's 
multi shader is really the tool to use for this. So I will pipe the multi shader into the color of the material, and I will also pipe it into the color splitter. And I will pipe the alpha channel into opacity. So that's our basic setup. Now we want to load into this multi shader all of the layers that were exported from Photoshop, and it has this handy little add from folder button. So I'm going to click that and go down to my folder, select the folder that has the layers exported out from Photoshop and hit OK and this loads up and it still continues to load each one. It loads a bunch of different shaders into this thing and it gives you the number that it's loaded, 29. That's because it counted up to 28 but it also counted zero. Now we need to say hey, each one of these needs to correspond to one of those. Give it a number. And we do that with a redshift tag, object tag. And we need to number all of these accordingly. And just from looking at the layers that are brought in in this order, I know that these are the higher ones and higher numbers, and these are the lower numbers. That means these are on top and these are on bottom. So. I can go to the object ID here and override it and I can give it a number. But if I give it like five or something, that's gonna give all of them five. I don't wanna go through and do this by hand for each one, one, two, three, four, five. So there's a trick in cinema, all of cinema responds to math. If I said three plus four, you're gonna get seven. It'll do the math in there. There's also another trick, which is if you type num, it will give it a progressively numbered res result. So, but I need it the other way around. So a little math will do it. You just take the number here, 29, and say one less than that, 28, and subtract num. And when you do that, it says, okay, this is number 28 and I'm going to subtract 0 so that will be 28 and then I'm this one 28 minus 1 so it's 27 this one is 28 minus 2 so it's 26 and so on all the way down to 0 and then we set the multi shader to respond to that right here on source we select object ID now we need to replace this single material across all of the objects by selecting them and it shows multiple values there we're going to make it one single value of this redshift material and you'll see all of those change cool so now we've got our layers in there and they are now controllable by MoGraph I can add a fracture object and drop all of these layers in there and on that fracture object, if I said I added it, like an, all, anything you want really at this point, you can, now that they have their numbers in the object tag, you can group them, you can move them into different orders. They're still going to keep their correct textures and alpha channels. And if I turn on like a step effector, you can see I get this effect where it starts to push them out by their, um, by their values uh, according to their Photoshop layer. So typing num into those redshift tags to get incremental numbers saved me a ton of work. Every single website that I imported, I used that and it made it so much quicker. On a side note, did you know in the Maxon help file under appendix formula, you can find all the mathematical operators and there's some really cool ones like X which represents the uh, parameters original value. So you could highlight a whole bunch of things and keep those numbers, but do something to them. Uh, random, which can sort of create randomness within a bunch of things that are selected. And these things could be really useful. Okay, so now let's go to the main breakdown project today. This is a personal project of mine and it's called Aries X.
So I'm going to try to break down this whole project. It might seem like there's a lot of stuff going on, and there kind of is, but there's also another way of looking at this where it it is actually made up of just a handful or two of very simple things. So if we use cinema to make very simple parts and combine them in different ways, we get really interesting results. I think that's the main thing that I want to get across here, but it's going to take going into each simple thing and looking at novel ways to do these things in cinema. So let's get started. The very first thing we're going to need is a screen to put stuff on. First, I'll make a plane. Then I'll add a redshift material. Then I'll add a texture node. And on that texture node, I'm just going to add this image just to start playing with. I'm going to add this to diffuse color but I'm also going to add it to overall emission. I'm using a Grayscale Gorilla HDRI in a dome light, but you could use area lights or anything else to light it. Now I'm going to turn up the overall emission weight. That's the light it's emitting, like a screen. And we start to have a pretty clean looking screen here. I'll widen this a bit. Let's take it further. I want to hint at the effect of resolution in the monitor here. So get a C4D shader and run that into a texture node so it can be seen by Redshift. And I'm just going to connect it to the output and we can see it starts off totally black. But I'm going to give it a tile shader. And in the tile shader, I'm going to change the grout color to be white and all the other colors to be black. I'm also going to change squares to circles. Now I'm going to make a blend material. So we're going to have two materials. We have this one that is just the emission of the image and we're going to make another one that I'm just going to turn off all these settings and make just black. Maybe it'll be a lot less reflective. So now I'm going to run that into my second layer in the material blender and I'm going to use these spots to blend between the two. I'll put it in the blend color. So now when we view the output, there we go. I find that if I go and just turn this scale up, it gets smaller like 44 and 44. You could start to see the resolution effect. Maybe we'll turn this a little higher. So you get the idea that's starting to have a nice look. But now I'm actually going to take away the reflection for this screen and add a piece of glass on top. I think it'll be a little more realistic with the way the light works. So I'm just saying this cube is our glass. And make a, another redshift material, put it on that glass, and we'll just choose the preset glass to start with. Then we'll put a bump map on. And this is going to be just to create slight little imperfections, because it is a monitor after all. I've got these textures that I've purchased online. And if I pipe that directly out, you can see what it looks like. And then I might use a ramp to control it, clean it up a little bit, adjust the levels. If I show you what that's doing, I crank this black up and it cleans it up a bit. So I'm going to put that in through the bump texture and let's look at it and it's very strong. So I'm just going to dial that back down from 1 to 0.1 and even that might be too much. Maybe I do still dial this back and it's pretty good. Now we can focus on putting dust on top of the glass. So I'm going to hold down control and make a copy of this material. So instead of it being glass, we'll make it plastic and not reflective at all. And in fact, just so we can see it, let's give it a crazy color in the emission. From there, we'll make another material blender and we'll take a look at that. And we'll put this one in the base color 
and this one in layer one color. And we're gonna use a texture to control the blending. So over here, we'll do a duplicate of these two. And instead of this texture, we'll replace it with something else. Like that. It looks like this. So we'll pipe that into layer one blend color and we can now see what that's doing. So we don't really need them to be red. I was just doing that to make it clearer. So we can change them to white. And so now we're set up to be using this texture to control the amount of dust on the screen. And if we look at it, you can see we've got pretty dirty piece of glass there. You might go to the Redshift camera tag and turn on Bokeh and turn the power up a little bit. And you can click here in Redshift to click to focus. And you can turn the COC radius up more and you get that real shallow depth of field blown out kind of look. Kind of a macro kind of feeling. So now we've got a screen that's dirty. And if you want to adjust the dust a bit more, you could clean up a little like that. And if you want, you can make this node on the gradient darker to make it all less intense. But I actually uh, like to do this other thing where instead of doing that, I just put a color correction node in the flow. And then I can just use the levels adjustment in that to control the overall intensity. So you just get a real easy dial to dial in the dust. Okay, so now we've got this screen built and we can put anything we want on it. So we got to make an animation and we got to make all these little bits and pieces because the way that a lot of this fooey stuff, graphical fake user interface sort of thing works is you have sort of two categories. You got the thing that you want to read and you want it to be seen by the audience. And then you've got the rest of the stuff that just kind of makes it feel like it's complex and a lot of stuff is going on. And in this situation, I consider the 3D scan of the robot dog to be the feature and everything else to be extra stuff around just kind of moving for complexity's sake. And I'm gonna show you this right here. See, I've got the um, animation here in After Effects. Uh, th these are the renders and you get this cool looking effect. Um, but let me break it down for you so you see that it's really just three very simple elements. Start with the wireframe. So there's just the wireframe. And then we add this pass, which I really love and we'll get into that. And then we have like a scan going through the body. So let's get right into it. I've got this bot here, which I've just made out of chunks of various kit bash kits. And I have a regular redshift material on it. And I'm going to make a wire frame node. And you can see what that's doing if I just pipe it all the way through. Turn off show hidden edges. You'll see what it does here on this cylinder mostly. Less triangles. Looks a lot more like it does in the viewport. And I'm gonna put it through an invert to make the whites black and the blacks white really easily. Cool. And right now the bot is wire shaded, but I'm gonna actually 
put that into this material now I'm going to put it in the uh, opacity color so now it's controlling it's only it's only not see through where the lines are which is pretty cool and it's reacting to light and that's a pretty cool look but I'm going to turn the omission up and white and reduce the wire thickness and this is closer to the look that I'm going for okay so that's our first layer the wireframe pass and now we're going to actually use that layer to generate the next one okay so here I have a plane with the animation on a regular Cinema 4D material just so you can see what that render looks like and I'm gonna make a cloner and I'm gonna just put a polygon into the cloner and I'm going to make a grid basically up on the Y. Uh, let's turn the polygon so that it's facing the Z axis and make it a lot smaller, really small. And mm, doesn't have to be in Z axis. So we can start to bring this grid together in a similar shape uh, that the 16 by 9 image is rendered. We can change it from per step to endpoint, and that way when you add more, it just fills it in. It's pretty cool. Okay, that's really pretty close. Um, now, I'm going to select the cloner, and I'm going to create a shader effector. In the shader effector, in shading, I'm going to just add that same animation that we have on the plane. And it doesn't look like it does that much at first. Let's go to parameter and it's got scale on. Let's just turn scale up and up. And what you start to see, I'm gonna make it really extreme, is that it's actually uh, taking the white from this image and, oh, and we in the shader effector, we have to go into that image and click calculate here and then it will have all the frames of your image sequence looks like it's backwards I'll flip it around so you can see it a little clearer so once you have this there's so many things you can do maybe I'll make the polygon a little smaller so you barely see it and then make the effect even stronger so you can really see it. And there's a lot of stuff that you can play with on this, maybe even adding a different parameter like the Z axis. So you get a little bit of, of that perspective in there. There's a lot of cool things that you could do. Adding delay effectors and stuff like that makes it pretty cool. But this is pretty much the effect that I was going for. So that's gonna be our second layer on top. Okay, so now let's go to the third layer, which is going to be this scanning through the body. And this is relatively simple as well. Okay, so I have my model again, but this time I have my redshift material on it that's emitting white, but I also have the opacity turned down to about halfway, so you can see through and see all these different parts. So it looks kind of like a x-ray or something. And I have all the parts and pieces to this bot right here. There's a lot of them. But I'm just gonna make a MoGraph fracture object bring that here and put all the parts and pieces to my robot in the fracture. And now I can use MoGraph stuff to control it. So I'm just going to make a plane effector and turn off the position, turn on scale, and turn it to absolute. So everything disappears. But now I can go over to the fall off and add a box field. This box field is now controlling things scaling as it goes over it. Wherever the box goes, things are scaled down. But we want to flip that around and make it the other way around. So 
I'll just go to the remapping section of the field and click invert. And now as I pull this box over the model, you get that scanning effect. And that's really all there is to it. Okay, so you got your three passes and there's your feature animation. And then you gotta make a whole bunch more GAC all around. And I think one of the strategies that really works for me is to make things as procedural as possible, to let things be driven by noise so that you can change a seed and get a completely new animation and to render really simple things and then use them in different ways, combining them, and you get a lot of use out of just a few things. So I'm gonna, as quickly as possible, take you through these really simple parts and pieces and hopefully there's little tidbits in there for you. Let's go. Okay, we're gonna start off making a line graph. First, I'll make a cube and I'm gonna make it really small, put it in a cloner, and I'll turn the cloner to linear. Instead of on the y-axis, I'll make it on the x-axis. Turn it up to however many points you want. And with the cloner selected, I'm going to add a shader effector so it will automatically be assigned to the effector section of the cloner. So in the shading section of the effector, I'm gonna add a noise. In the parameter section, turn off scale and turn on position. Turn it up on the y-axis and now that noise is randomly putting your cubes in different places. And I'm going to click into the noise and turn the animation speed up to 1. And now they're moving. Okay, to loop it for 3 seconds, I'm just going to turn the loop period to 3 and now it should loop seamlessly. And for a different pattern of motion, you just change the seed. Add a tracer object and it's tracing them. But if you change it from trace paths to connect all objects, you've got a line graph. Okay, a little house cleaning. You gotta put the tracer down below the cloner in the object manager. It's just how the object manager works. It evaluates things from the top down, so that fixes the priority. First the cloner happens, then the tracer. I'm gonna go to the tracer object and turn intermediate points to natural, and under type, select cubic or bezier to make the graph smooth. But if we render in redshift, the dots are there, but the spline is not. You have to give it a redshift tag and tell it how to render. Change it to one of these options, and then now it shows up. To fill it in underneath the graph, we're gonna make an end side, but turn it down to just two sides. Now bring it down by the tracer and put them both into a loft object. And you make it the right size and turn the loft objects subdivisions up to make it smoother. And I'm just gonna make a redshift material specifically for that that has a lower opacity. And so we have an animated graph that's reacting in real time to our noise. This slider graph is pretty much the same thing. They move up and down and I just have a clone, I cloned a bunch of boxes back here. I have one cloner for, for these being driven by noise and a shader effector. And here's another cool little trick, if you right click on that cloner, add a display tag, go to ghosting, enable it, nothing will happen right away because this is on a mo on MoGraph. If it was a regular animated object, you would see the ghosting, 
but on a MoGraph object, you have to calculate cache, which happens really fast. And now you get these cool ghosting effects. Now this won't render out in Redshift, but what you can do is you can open your render settings and choose viewport render. Then it will render what you see in the viewport. Okay, let's do a bar chart. Make a regular cube, and you see, if you make it taller, it goes on the top and the bottom. We don't want that, we want it to just drive straight up. So here's a little espresso trick to keep that uh, parametric. I make a null, and I put the cube in the null. And on top of that, I'm going to go to Programming, Espresso, and make an Espresso tag. And don't get scared, because this is really simple and easy to understand. In this Espresso tag, we're going to change some controls, basically. So I'm going to bring the cube in here once, and I'm going to bring the cube in here again. Just two different instances of the same thing. Now, for the height, the Y height, that's going to be my controller. So I'm going to put that on this, this side of this one. And for the input, I'm going to control the Y position. So I'll grab this cube and go over to coordinates and take the Y position. So it's the position of the Y and the size of Y. Now if I just put them straight together, if I put them straight into each other, as I increase the, sorry, as I increase the height of the cube, it also goes up. So that's not what we want. It's closer, but it's not what we want. We actually want it to go half because the cube is growing on both sides of it equally. So we need a math node. Math, add, and I'm going to put this for the top number, the size, and then I'm just going to change it from add to divide. And I'm going to say divide by 2, so it's half. Now if I put that into the Y position and we adjust the size, it just grows straight up from the ground. So now we can make a bar chart with that. Call this a bar. So I'm going to make one that is very tall. And I'm going to make one that is very small. and put them both in a cloner. Turn that cloner to linear, not on the Y, but on the X. And instead of iterate, we're going to change it to blend. And what that does is it's basically combining every clone, however many clones you have, to blend from the tallest to the shortest. Or let's make a shader effector. And if we go to that shader effector and add noise, what we want to do is turn off all of the parameters and just turn up modify clone. So that means that instead of changing position, it's now only just giving us a noise that controls the blending between the tallest one and the shortest one. So as we get more contrast, and brightness we can control exactly what's going on here. I have it set up to render for three seconds. So in the loop period, I'm going to put three. Then I'm just going to turn up the animation speed. Let's try one right now and see what happens. So it's moving each thing and it loops. If you want a different animation, just change the seed. That's essentially the, the trick to having the noises work for you. For this one, we're going to do the same trick of blending
clones in a cloner. This one's kind of cool. So I'll make one that's long and one that's short, let's say. And we'll put them in a cloner. And this time we're going to turn the cloner to object. We're going to make a plane. The plane will face us on the z-axis. We'll give that plane to the cloner. So it's cloning it on the geometry. So that's a start. We don't want to say surface. We put them on the vertex. Some people don't know, some people do know but you can use all of the effectors as deformers as well, as long as you just go to the deformer tab and click on points or whatever you want to deform, make it a child of that geometry. So it goes all crazy. That's okay for now. Um, let's go to the parameter and make sure that it only is going side to side on the x-axis. Now we can make it pretty extreme. And we can make it invisible. So we're starting to get some interestingness here. We can even go more. If you change the seed, it changes the pattern. I didn't know this for a long time, but if you animate the seed, you think it just jumped from one number to the next. But it doesn't. It actually moves between the seeds. Interpolation. That is so cool. So, so if you if I turn off redshift here, that is awesome. So you can just jump between seeds So if you add a delay effector, it's doing some really cool stuff, but it's spinning all around like that. So how do we make it not do that? On the delay effector, turn off rotation. So you get these really cool smooth sort of processing feeling. And that's what you want with these things is you want them to be like as if they're really responding to something or, or thinking about something. Now we're gonna do this, what I call a target array. This one is a good example of using randomness to drive things for you. So create a, a spline rectangle and create another one. We're gonna make this one a lot smaller and we're gonna use a sweep and put them under the sweep so that that makes a shape around it. Now we're gonna use a bool just to chop that up. So here's a bool, put, it, put the sweep in the bool for A, and then for B, make a null under it. It's gonna be A minus B. So then in B, we'll make a cube, we'll make it really tall, We'll make a duplicate of that cube and rotate it around this way and take both of those and drop them in the null for B and they subtract from that. Now we got a target. So we can put that in a cloner and set up a grid. Maybe we make it a lot smaller like that. Go up a couple we've got a target grid. Now I'm gonna make a duplicate of this whole cloner and put nothing in it except for a new cube. And make that cube really small. So it's just a dot. So there's our grid. Okay, select the cloner and add a plane effector. Turn off position, but turn on visibility. Now, under fall off, add a shader field. And 
they go invisible. Now in the shader field, you can add a noise shader. I'm going to animate the seed again. But this time, but this time I'm just going to make it random values so it starts and stops. which makes it feel more like it's processing stuff. So that's pretty cool. So you have control with the high clip and the low clip of how many of these you really want there. And then again, what's really cool about this is you can add the render display tag and turn on ghosting. Render and turn on ghosting click calculate and you get these really cool effects render it out with your viewport renderer and you got more GAC okay time to make a circle thing make a tube and have it face us on the z-axis turn up the rotation segments so it's smooth I think in this situation it's important to make materials that have differing levels of opacity. So I'm going to go to this, I'm going to turn the emission weight up to 1 and I'm going to make the height 1, turn the opacity down. I'll make another material and I'll change the value for that as well and I'll make one more material with another value. On the tube go to slice and slice it. So we can make differing sized circles with the tubes rotate them, just giving them some variations. You can also do a cylinder and they're all on the x-axis, they're all on the z-axis exactly in the same spot. So here's a little trick. You can go to the z-coordinates and if you type num times 2. They move a little bit in Z space and that's how you can get them to kind of clear each other. Now I might move this around a bit, do something like that. Maybe this is actually less. You can do it to your liking. You could even do a black one. Now put them all in a MoGraph fracture object. Create a shader effector. Turn off scale and turn on rotation. And put a noise in there. And all of a sudden you have something then we can put a delay effector to smooth it back out. You could change the noise to cell noise. Turn the speed back down. Let's turn the delay back down. and it's jumping from different parameters to different parameters. So many things you could do here, but that's circle graph. So once you have like five or 10 of these things, you can actually just start mixing and matching and combining them and then using different offsets. So they start at different times to make them seem like they're a whole lot more. Here's an example of how I threw together a big screen 
with each of these elements just being used in different ways across the whole screen. So for modeling the plastics around the screen, I used Volume Builder because there's this cool smoothness that you get out of it that's like consumer electronics and it's really fast. I'll show you a little trick. Here I have a pretty typical Volume Builder setup where I have a cube and a capsule and if I move this capsule around you can see the capsule is subtracting from the cube. I can add a smooth on top of that and it smooths it out a bit, which is nice. But here's where we can make more of this procedural setup. If I duplicate this whole stack and delete everything that's in it, then drop these things back in it from here, they're referencing it, which is really cool. And now if I set the cube to intersect, it's essentially recreating what it's subtracting as a button I can put the smooth back on it and essentially becomes this really cool smooth geometry that's alive so you can design stuff and from there on out you can duplicate things and anything you have in that null will both be cut out and added back with this cool kind of smoothness that you might find in like electronics and for the camera, I did some kit bashing, but I mostly used a lot of Boolean modeling, which you get that really quick, fun way of creating and exploring, and uh, it's very fast. But there are some gotchas, like right here, where I rendered my render out and I realized that the Boolean was going crazy on me and I was getting this flicker. So rather than going back and rendering this whole shot again, I fixed it in post with Red Giant Kingpin Tracker and it saved me a ton of render time. So this is how that works. Basically, I just find a frame where it's looking the way I'd like it to look and make a duplicate of that layer. Then I right click and go to time, freeze frame. Now I've got that frame as a still. I'm gonna put the effect kingpin tracker on that layer and I'm going to turn it off for the moment and put the corners of kingpin tracker around the face of the camera because that's the plane I wanna track. Then I'm gonna select the non-frozen layer. Before I track, I'm gonna show the from pins and the to pins down here and copy one to the other. Now I'll just track backwards and forwards. You can see it tracking here. That's backwards and I'll track forwards from the point that I had set as my start frame. Now back on the start frame, I'm gonna turn Kingpin Tracker back on. I'm gonna make a mask around the area that I want to use, which is just this part right here. And now I'll hit play. And it's almost like magic. No more flicker there. Yeah, saves a ton of time. These are the post tricks that get you from a raw render to a final frame. And one more trick that I think helped really raise the level of this project was to use an adjustment layer on top of the shot and I used Red Giant Optical Glow. 
and turned up highlights only a little bit, played with the settings a little. Maybe uh, some levels there to just sort of darken the blacks a little bit more to make it look dark, but yet still, still shiny, still glowy. You can see what a difference that makes. That glow is just that added little touch. And so from there, you've got your renders and you edit them together, put some sound, put some music, and make some cool stuff. I hope you found something interesting. I really enjoyed doing this. Feel free to reach out to me. Our website is samplistic.com and my email is michael at samplistic.com. Go make some cool stuff. All the best.